so we are going to start prostate so first have a look of anatomy of prostate according to the older classification there are five lobes in prostate so suppose i am going to take this kind of sagittal section on this sagittal section what is the appearance have a look this is bladder i will make prostate a bit large in this chapter so that you are able to understand everything clearly this is prostate this is urethra this is the opening of ejaculatory duct now can you see if this is the sagittal section what are the lobes this one is anterior lobe this one is posterior lobe this one is median lobe and there are two lateral lobes so suppose this is the prostate if i'm going to take this kind of sagittal section this is anterior lobe this is posterior these two are lateral and area above ejaculatory duct opening is known as median lobe questions are asked according to this older classification bph is most common in which lobe so bph is most common in median lobe so it is most common in median lobe after that question is asked carcinoma prostate carcinoma prostate is most common in posterior lobe and if we are going to perform digital rectal examination can you see on the digital rectal examination mainly we are going to feel which lobe of prostate is the posterior lobe and sometimes which one the median lobe when it's enlarged so on digital rectal examination the posterior lobe is felt and median lobe this is older classification not used nowadays which classification is used nowadays and that is macneil zones nowadays we are using what macneil zones so what is this macneil zones in the prostate have a look this simple anatomy now can you see this is urethra around urethra there is periurethral muscles so around urethra there is periurethral muscles two third of this urethra is covered by transition zone usually one third is covered by central zone and peripherally peripherally there is peripheral zone and here there is anterior fibromuscular stroma so what are these zones have a look one by one this one is transition zone this one is central zone this one is peripheral zone and this area is anterior fibromuscular anterior fibromuscular stroma so this is anterior fibromuscular stroma so there are three zones peripheral zone transitional zone central zone and there is anterior fibromuscular stroma questions are asked bph is most common in which zone bph is most common is transition zone whereas carcinoma prostate is most common in which zone peripheral zone so bph is most common in transition zone whereas carcinoma prostate is most common in peripheral zone now one simple question have a look suppose patient is having bph and there are two nodules can you see this is one nodule and there is second nodule one is red colored second is black colored tell me which one is symptomatic you can see the black colored nodule is symptomatic why because it is very close to urethra it means what happens there is no correlation between size of prostate and severity of symptoms here the severity of symptoms will be dependent on the relation of nodule and the urethra if it is close to urethra even if the nodule is small 
patient will be symptomatic. And if it's a large nodule but located away from urethra, patient will not be having symptoms. So, first statement, there is no correlation. No correlation between size of prostate and severity of symptoms. So, there is no correlation between size of prostate and severity of symptoms in BPH. First, second, most common site of carcinoma prostate is peripheral zone. So, most patients who are having carcinoma prostate, they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. Yes, asymptomatic. Why? Because there is no close relation of these nodules with urethra. So, second important point, most patients of Carcinoma prostate are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic in initial stages. Third point, we are going to perform screening of carcinoma prostate by DRE plus PSA. The screening of carcinoma prostate is done by digital rectal examination plus PSA prostate specific antigen. Clear? Now see. In patients of BPH, what we are going to perform? We are going to perform TURP, transurethral resection of prostate. Have a look. In transurethral resection of prostate, can you see what we are going to remove? The prosthetic tissue, the tissue located in this transition zone. After cutting some part of urethra, I am going to remove the tissue in this region. If I am going to remove tissue in this region, what? Only tissues from transition zone is removed. And the most common site of carcinoma is peripheral zone. It means TURP is not protective for carcinoma prostate. So, third important point TURP is not protective. It is not protective for carcinoma prostate. So, if TURP is not protective for carcinoma prostate, even after TURP, what happens? Digital rectal examination plus PSA should be continued for screening of carcinoma prostate. So, it should be continued even after TURP for screening of carcinoma prostate. These are the basic principles which I will be using in this chapter of prostate and this is the basic diagram which you have to remember because it will solve most of the MCQs. So, now we are going to start BPH that's benign prostatic hyperplasia. BPH full form is benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is age related endocrine controlled multifactorial process. age related endocrine control multifactorial process okay most common site of bph you told me already is transition zone so first question how it is age related have a look if the age of patient is 41 to 50 years the incidence of bph is 20 percent if the age is 51 to 60 years incidence is 50 percent and whenever the age of patient is more than 80 years the incidence is 90 percent. So, can you see it is age related. Second statement it is endocrine controlled means it is under the control of which hormone under the control of testosterone. So, it is age related endocrine controlled multifactorial process. There are other factors which are also responsible for BPH. Okay. After that, I am going to tell you a simple principle on which the pharmacology of BPH is going to depend. What is that simple principle? Have a look. In this case, there is benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So, there are formation of hyperplastic nodules. Now, have a look. 
I am going to take a cut section from this hypoplastic nodule. After taking cut section, there are two parts of this nodule. First, there is epithelium, and second, there is stroma. So, there is epithelium and there is stroma. Now, see, this stroma is further composed of two things one is collagen, and second is smooth muscle. Collagen and smooth muscle. This is the basic component. Okay. After that, you know that testosterone is not the active substance. It has to be converted into active substance that's known as 5 dihydrotestosterone. So, have a look. This testosterone should be converted into 5 dihydrotestosterone. And what is the enzyme responsible for this? 5 alpha reductase so this 5 alpha reductase converts testosterone to 5 dihydrotestosterone and this one is having its main action on the epithelium since it's having its main action on epithelium there is proliferation of epithelium now what happens the prosthetic stroma is having rich adrenergic nerve endings so if there is rich adrenergic nerve endings and if there is smooth muscle predominance, what we can give? We can give alpha blockers. These alpha blockers helps in relaxation of smooth muscle. Now see, if the epithelium component is predominant, we can give 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. And if smooth muscle component is predominant, we can give alpha blockers. So here, we are using 5 alpha reductase inhibitors and these 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are going to inhibit 5 alpha reductase and when epithelium component is predominant these agents are preferred for smooth muscle relaxation we are giving what alpha blockers and these alpha blockers causes smooth muscle relaxation so if smooth muscle component is predominant alpha blockers are used if Epithelial component is predominant, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are used. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Alpha blockers are instantaneously active. You give it, there is relaxation of smooth muscle. What's the problem with 5 alpha reductase inhibitors? You start 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, there is already some amount of 5 dihydrotestosterone which is there. It keeps on working. That's why minimum time required to act is one month for five alpha reductase inhibitors minimum time required to act one month and the maximum effect is seen after six months so important points alpha blockers are instantaneously active and preferred what is the problem with 5 alpha reductase inhibitors? Require minimum one month to act. It require minimum one month to act and maximum effect. Maximum effect is seen after six months. So, maximum effect is seen after 6 months. That's why alpha blockers are preferred or 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. One problem. Now, see what are the changes in the prostate and what are the changes in bladder in the patients of BPH. So, again, same diagram. Have a look. This is bladder, this is prostate, and this is urethra. Now, in this case, can you see? This is the urethra. What's the problem in BPH? Can you see? There is formation of these kind of nodules. And if there is formation of these kind of nodules, these nodules are going to compress what? Urethra. And when there is compression of urethra, bladder has to increase the force during micturition. So, bladder increases the force. Bladder has to contract 
and to expel the urine out of urethra. So there is increased force of contraction. Since this is a chronic change, on daily basis bladder is increasing the force. So what will happen? There are secondary changes in the bladder. And what are those secondary changes? There is collagen deposition. There is detrusor muscle hyperplasia and detrusor muscle hypertrophy. How to understand this? Suppose you are having a dumbbell in your hand and you are doing this. What? You are contracting your muscle against resistance. What will happen? There is hypertrophy. Of muscle fibers, same thing in bladder. Since bladder has to contract against resistance over a period of time, there is hypertrophy in the muscle of bladder. What's the muscle? Detrusor muscle. So not only hypertrophy, there is hyperplasia also. So what are those secondary changes in the bladder? There is detrusor muscle hypertrophy. Detrusor muscle hyperplasia. and collagen deposition and that's why sometimes that's why there is thickened bladder wall and sometimes there is formation of bladder diverticula also these changes are responsible for irritative symptoms and what are those irritative symptoms it's fun frequency urgency nocturia so it is fun that is frequency urgency nocturia so these are the symptoms irritative symptoms now what happens can you see there is obstruction because of these nodules and there are obstructive symptoms also so patients of bph are having two sets of symptoms obstructive and irritative so see clinical features first obstructive symptoms There is poor flow, poor stream, hesitancy, intermittency, incomplete evacuation of bladder, and sometimes there is dribbling of urine because of poor flow and there is post residual volume what are the irritative symptoms irritative symptoms are because of secondary change in the bladder and these are fun frequency urgency and nocturia so it's frequency, urgency and nocturia, irritative symptom. In patients of BPH, we are going to calculate one score. And what's that? In short, it is known as IPSS. What's the full form? The full form is International International Prostatic Symptom Score. So, International Prostatic Symptom Score. How much is the score? It varies from 0 to 35. Now, see how we are going to label mild, moderate and severe symptoms. Mild symptoms, if the score is 0 to 7. Moderate symptoms, if the score is 8 to 19. And severe symptoms, if the score is 20 to 35. So, this is the labeling. International Prosthetic Symptom Score Mild Symptoms 0 to 7, Moderate 8 to 19, and Severe 20 to 35. But I told you there is no correlation between size of prostate and severity of symptoms. Okay, now see in these patients, we are going to perform what? Digital rectal examination. If we are going to perform digital rectal examination, what is the finding? Findings are there is smooth. Elastic enlargement. 
So there is smooth, elastic enlargement of prostate. How we are going to differentiate it from carcinoma prostate? In carcinoma prostate, prostate is enlarged and it's hard. Enlarged and hard with obliteration of median sulcus. So there is obliteration of median sulcus. These are the findings. So this is how we can differentiate. But be careful. I told you no correlation between size of prostate and severity of symptoms. That's why we have to document the obstruction. And after documenting obstruction only, we can confirm the diagnosis of BPH. So how we are going to document the obstruction? We are going for urophlometry. So we are going to assess or measure the urine flow per second. It is assessed by Qmax. Qmax is maximum flow rate. If it's more than 15 ml per second, it's normal. If it's 10 to 15 ml per second, it is equivocal. And if it is less than 10 ml per second, it is suggestive of obstruction. Be careful, I told you that it's suggestive of, of, of obstruction, not the confirmatory finding of obstruction. What does it mean? Suppose a patient is having neurogenic bladder. In the neurogenic bladder also, there is no force. If there is no force, what happens? Flow rate will be obviously less than 10 ml per second. And in BPH, there is increased force in the bladder. But since there is obstruction, obviously the Q max is less than 10 ml per second. So how we are going to differentiate whether this low flow is because of obstruction or because of neurogenic bladder? Easily. We can measure the bladder pressure. If the bladder pressure is very high, it is because of obstruction. And if the bladder pressure is low, it is because of neurogenic bladder. So it is the second investigation which is performed to confirm the finding. It's the systometry. So we have to perform systometry. And on systometry, widening pressure should be more than 80 centimeter of H2O. Be careful, it's not MMHG. It's 80 centimeter of H2O. So when widening pressure or bladder pressure is more than 80 centimeter of H2O. In some entrance exams, they asked the diagnostic criteria of BPH. Diagnostic criteria for BPH on the investigation. Q max less than 10 ml per second and bladder pressure or widening pressure more than 80 centimeter of H2O. When this finding is fulfilled, it means patient is having BPH and there is obstruction. And in these cases, what we have to start? The treatment. So treatment, I told you which agents are preferred. Alpha blockers are preferred. So what are the alpha blockers which are given? Rajosin. Terajosin, Doxajosin, Elfujosin, and there is a new drug which was asked in exam, Silodosin. But be careful, most commonly used is Tamsulosin. Why Tamsulosin is most commonly used? Because it is alpha 1A selective blocker. It is alpha 1A selective blocker. So this is preferred. Usually alpha blockers are preferred. What are the five alpha reductase inhibitors which are given? The agents are phenasteride, deutasteride, and Triptorelin palm oil. Finasteride, Deutasteride, and Triptorelin palm oil. These are the second line agents which are used. 
but alpha blockers are preferred. In some patients, we are giving combination treatment. Combination treatment means both alpha blockers plus 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. Question is asked in which cases combination treatment is preferred? Obviously, the patients having large prostates, patients having large prostates and having high value of PSA or raised PSA level. So, patients having large prostates and high value of PSA or raised PSA, we are giving combination treatment of alpha blockers and 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. Let me tell you, in majority of patients, drug management or medical management is sufficient, not usually associated with complications. Usually, patient is going to tolerate these drugs. But questions are asked, what are the indications of surgical intervention? So, indications of surgical intervention. First, no improvement. So, there is no improvement after medical management. Second, recurrent infections or recurrent UTI. Third, hydronephrosis or renal failure. Fourth, bladder stone. Fifth, gross hematuria. And sixth, refractory urinary retention. Sixth is refractory urinary retention. So, these are six indications for surgery.